Simon. Uh, a real quick commercial on who's got your back. Everybody know about this? Who doesn't know about this? Who's willing to admit they don't know about this? Okay. So this is a campaign to help people understand about safe space on grounds and also the idea of uh, intervention, uh, so to speak, uh, bystander or peer or uh, uh, other people uh, intervening if you see somebody who looks like they're in danger or out of or in some kind of uh, potentially getting harmed situation, try and reduce harm uh, that other people that people might experience. And uh, Jenny has agreed to model big. the t-shirt. <laughs> yeah. um, so, it's so, a little big. Yeah. <laughs> so that's so that's that's what that is. And, and um, there's training going on this week, right? I I, I myself don't know nearly as much. So. Okay, so hello, I'm Patrick Tolan. I'm the director of the Youth Next Center, um, and this is the Curry Research Lecture Series that uh, is contributed to by several parts of Curry, uh, and we try to bring in uh, renowned speakers uh, to speak in really in ways that connect across the many diverse areas that Curry uh, has uh, research going on and interest in. And so it's really a great idea to have Jenny kick this off because that's exactly uh, a great way of encapsulating her. She's one of these people that just cannot help but think broadly and cannot help but think about the connections of multiple disciplines and multiple ways of thinking. Uh, so it's not only always fun to talk with her because you got to keep up, um, but it's also uh, very interesting because she knows about lots of little things and she connects things. Um, but at the same time, she has deep expertise in, in what she's going to talk about today. So let me introduce her to you if you haven't already uh, read her uh, introductions. Um, before I'm going to do that, let me also tell you about the additional, uh, the next speak, speaker is Brian Jacob on seven, September 30th. He's, Wal he's the Walter Annenberg Professor of Education Policy and Professor of Economics at the Gerald uh, Ford School of Public Policy. He's going to speak about differential accountability and education production evidence from the NCLB waivers. Also want to remind you that Roger Weisberg, who's from Castle and the University of Illinois at Chicago, is coming on December 2nd to speak about uh, the social-emotional learning uh, movement. And then Valerie Mahomes, who's the senior uh, administrator at the National Institute of Child uh, Health and Human Development, and uh, is coming to speak in a more private capacity. She has written a really great book on resilience in children, and she's coming down to speak on that's on February 24th. Uh, those two are, are the talks sponsored by Youth Next. There are other talks, which I'm sure you've seen around here in email. So, Professor Rowe is the Mary Irene Deshaun Professor in Design and Health, and she's the Director of the Center for Design and Health in the School of Architecture. However, uh, prior to coming to be in the School of Architecture, she was a, a landscape architect turned environmental psychologist. Um, and she led the Health and Well-Being and Behavior Change for the Stockholm Environment Institute, a global think tank on driving research on sustainability in healthy cities. Um, but she's best known as a uh, restorative environments researcher, which she will, her talk will explain um, what that means. Um, most of her research focuses on uh, inequities in economically disadvantaged communities, including racial and ethnic minorities, children and teenagers, elderly and the people, and chronic health conditions. Um, and what I would say is that what she really is talking about is the human uh, environment interaction and fit, uh, and how do we want to think about that? And uh, if there's a, we want to think about a global uh, big force these days that we recognize this is the only planet we got. We're running out of time to make sure we have it for a couple more generations, and uh, so her work is vital. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to her and welcome her. Uh, and this is just one last thing. This is our new app, uh, our, new, our new bot. Me too. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Okay, it's back. Um, well, thank you very much, Patrick, for that introduction. And it's a real joy and pleasure to be here in Curry talking about my research. Um, I arrived from the UK last fall, and it's really wonderful how this community has embraced the notion of what I'm going to call natural solutions, using nature to really solve some of our global challenges health and well-being and some of our problems with behaviour in schools, which is what I'm talking about today. 
I can fall into English mannerisms, so if there's words that I use that are unfamiliar, please just interrupt and I will try and uh, interpret those. So what am I going to do today? I'm going to talk to you for about, I think, 50 minutes or so. I think that's long enough. I'm going to show a couple of very short films that the children I have worked with have made. Um, the quality is not fantastic because they've been made by, by youth, but I think you might find them interesting. Um, I'm going to give a theoretical context of restorative environment research and what it means and what natural solutions mean. I'm going to look at the wider evidence base for effects of nature in the school setting. A lot of that research has come from Europe, and particularly Scandinavia. And then I'm going to focus on three studies that have looked at the value of education outdoors, outdoor classrooms, um, as compared to activities indoor. Um, then three studies, one looking at primary school children in what I call mainstream schools, standard schools, and then in teenagers, um, adolescents aged 11 to 13 in two different settings, a mainstream school and then a specialist residential school for children with particular behaviour problems. So firstly, what is a restorative environment? Well, a restorative environment offers psychological restoration. That can be in the short term. It can be restoration from cognitive fatigue, stress, and poor mood. It could also mean short-term improvements in behavior. And typically, natural settings are renowned for their restorative capabilities. My next slide begins to unpick this a little bit more. Much of the research in my field has focused on short-term restoration, quite often carried out in laboratory settings with students. When I came into this field, um, when I switched from landscape architecture into environmental psychology as a discipline, I was really struck by the number of studies, this would be around about 2005, that were done in laboratories with students, comparing images of nature with images of the urban built environment. And I resisted that very, very strongly. And what I have really tried to do in my research is take the research outdoors. That makes it messy research because we have a whole host of confounding variables, climate, weather, rain. Um, we have the individuals in that environment. We can't control for them. But it's much more fascinating and, and real life to me to do that. And then a lesser um, known area of research really is what we call longer term restoration. This has been called instoration. This is the notion that a restorative environment can really build over the long term or strengthen a capability or resource like self-esteem. There's not a lot of research in that field currently, partly because longitudinal research funding is very hard to get, as I'm sure some of you are aware of. Um, so, this was a really nice piece in the National Geographic in January 2016, and the image has come from the National Geographic, um, and it really explains this effect of nature very, very simply. And Kaplan and Kaplan, two psychologists, posited this theory as long ago as 1989. It's called Attention Restoration Theory. And the idea is that uh, the built environment, city environments, grab our attention in a very dramatic way. This is called directed attention. And it depletes our resources. It makes us cognitively fatigued, less effective and stressed. Now, a walk in nature or even just looking at nature from your office window um, draws on what's called our involuntary attention. And it's a soft stimuli of nature trees, water, light patterns, sunsets, that allows our brain to disengage, to rest and restore our capacity for directed attention. And there are four components of restorative environments, um, according to the Kaplan theory. One is fascination, i.e. these environments have to be intrinsically fascinating and curious. This means they're not just nature settings, they might be aquariums, they might be cafes, they might be historic districts, or indeed architectural buildings that are curious and interesting. Um, but a lot of the work has focused on nature as a restorative setting. So fascination is one of those components. It's the sense of being away, getting away from your routine. The notion of extent, which really refers to the sense of a whole other world, taking yourself up and out of where you happen to be, 
and compatibility, which Patrick touched upon earlier. Really, as an environmental psychologist, what we're really trying to understand is environment fit, how an environment supports your goals and nurtures that fit with, with, with you as an individual. So that's just a little bit of a theory around about restorative environments. If we turn to health and how nature can support health, um, I was involved in this publication uh, that came out in 2014, um, which was commissioned by Public Health England called Natural Solutions for Tackling Healthy Inequalities. And what, just to kind of flag two points from that study, so there is now quite a wealth of evidence to show that better health is related to access to green space, regardless of socioeconomic status and income, and even indeed that more deprived urban communities, poorer communities, actually have more to gain from access to green space, because if you're unemployed, you tend to be around it for, for longer. Um, and also some very limited evidence showing that interventions using the natural environment to improve health can actually drive cost savings for health and related services. And one of the studies I'm working on in Scotland or continue to work on is using a health economist to actually cost benefit um, the savings to health of improving access to urban woodlands. So that's an interesting publication to look at um, if you're interested in health inequalities. If we just focus now on children and teens, um, I talked about short-term restoration and how a lot of this research has been done uh, using pre and post um, intervention studies. So typically, uh, say with a child, you might expose a child to a walk in a park. You would measure them before that walk and after that walk and see how their attention or their mood has changed. And there's a team um, led by Faye Taylor, I think they're based at the University of Michigan, that have done a lot of work in relation to short-term restorative effects. That's attention restoration, restoration from fatigue that makes you more productive, more cognitively more productive, effective restoration, which is really restoration from low mood, and stress reduction. Nancy Wells, an environmental psychologist at Cornell, has done a lot of work around this area. But you'll see some of that work is quite dated, 2002, 2003, so not much movement there in recent years. I myself have looked at instaurative effects over time. I'm not talking about that work today. It's quite, um, it's quite involved, and uh, I didn't feel there was time to really relay that as well as the other studies, but I can give you a paper around that um, study if there's interest. Um, specific psychiatric conditions. Again, the Faber Taylor team have done some very interesting work looking at children with ADHD, attention deficit disorder, and how exposure to green settings can really help with symptom severity um, and improve behavior. And then just very briefly on autism, um, the jury is really out as to whether nature and natural settings can help with autism. Um, Natural England have pulled that evidence together in a publication which came out in 2014. I'm going to talk about autism a little bit later, but more in relation to light and daylight exposure. And finally, a study that I've done, two studies I've done actually, um, what I'm kind of interested in is how our capacity for restoration, is, it, it varies. And Two experiments I did have shown that the intensity of a restorative experience can actually be influenced by your mental health state. So people with a poorer mental health state, people who are more stressed, more angry, more depressed, actually their rate of restoration after exposure to a natural environment is higher than those people who aren't suffering from those conditions. I've recently pulled all of this evidence together for a publication that's in press, which I'm just flagging here. It's not being released yet, it'll be released in November. But that um, paper is really looking at cities, green space and mental well-being across a specific range of um, psychiatric problems. When I came into this field, again, just to reiterate, the research was done in students in laboratory settings. One of the things I've been trying to drive 
It's how nature and how natural settings can really help with specific psychiatric disorders. So if we look at school performance now, which is the essence of, of this presentation, um, most of the research has come out relatively recently. Uh, Sue Waite in the UK has shown how classrooms outdoors improve levels of social interaction, and also she's studied nonverbal communication outdoors in young children. Um, this is a really interesting study done in Scandinavia. Um, you may be aware that countries like Finland have some of the highest literacy rates in the world. They expose their early years children to one hour of being outdoors every day, whatever the weather. And this study, um, this next study here has come from um, Scandinavia. It's in teenagers um, and they looked at memory recall um, over a task, a biology task that was carried out outdoors versus indoors. And then they tested that recall five months um, post-experiment and they found better or improved memory recall from the task undertaken outdoors, but also evidence of better social interaction among school children and improved mood, effective impact there. And then creativity, um, again a study done by Sue Waite um, in the UK. She found evidence of greater creativity in children's activities in natural settings. So there's just some background and context for the work I'm going to present. So when I, how, how have I explored behaviour and mental health well-being in children and teenagers? I've used this model, it's a UK model, it may not be one that you're particularly familiar with, but it has a spectrum of behaviour and you'll hear me referring to these groups as I progress through my talk. So, Kids who have no behaviour problem, and then we have kids that have some behaviour problem. They might have been earmarked at school as at risk in some way. Um, and then we have the kids who really are in trouble. They maybe have um, been removed from school. They, they uh, are trying to be rehabilitated back into school. And then we have the kids who are suffering from a really severe mental problem. These are the kids I'm going to be talking about in the final study who have been removed from society altogether into a residential school context, which um, in the case I'm going to be talking about later is more or less a kind of prison environment. So that's a spectrum that I've looked at in my research. So the first study um, I have supervised um, as a primary supervisor in the UK um, led by Jamie Hamilton and Jamie's looked at primary school children and memory recall um, and a similar experiment to the Scandinavian study I just outlined he looked at an indoor task versus an outdoor task he had a whole host of research questions the one that I'm focusing in on today is this first one and he hypothesized that the cognitive performance of primary school children on a curriculum task would be better in a natural setting as compared to a classroom. Now, we call this kind of research out there in the field in environmental psychology quasi-experimental. And he did this work in three Scottish primary schools, which he matched on a whole load of demographic and socioeconomic variables. They were in poor, deprived urban areas. So we measure that in the UK by the number of kids who actually get free school dinners. I'm not sure how you do it here in the USA. Their mean age was five and a half, and we call it a repeat measures design. So the kids did a task indoors, they did a similar task outdoors. The settings in these three schools ranged across the spectrum of nature. So he had an outdoor playground, I think you would call it a schoolyard here, which was largely hard built materials, a lot of tarmac bitumen and then a more softer setting, and then a much more wilder setting, a woodland edge to that school environment. Now his main outcome variable here in relation to this particular hypothesis was cognitive performance, which, as I've mentioned, he measured by memory recall. And he asked six months post these tasks an open-ended question, and he recorded the answers. He asked the children to tell me one thing you remember about the lesson. 
anyone further, any prompted, it was simple open-ended prompts, you know, anything more, anything else you can tell me. He still hasn't finished this research, but he's looking at the language that was used in relation to those responses. I'll come on to some of the results in a moment. Um, I think the other thing to say about environmental psychology research is we often use mixed methods, so we triangulate. So he was using a range of other, other uh, methods in terms of child task recollections, teacher interviews, he did a lot of observation and video analysis, and child and teacher surveys on setting preferences, i.e. why did the children prefer to do these tasks, and setting richness, which captured the degree of nature um, in those settings. This is just an example of the design in one of those schools. So he had a reasonable mix of male and female. He had two different groups, and they were exposed to two tasks actually in the school. The first was making a toy, one of which took place in the classroom, and one of which took place in the outdoors. And the other task was a puppet tour. He got the kids to make a puppet, in both the indoor classroom and the outdoor classroom, and then they were to navigate through these environments, telling a story with the puppet. He worked very closely with the teachers too to really get these tasks compatible so that they could be carried out both indoors and outdoors. And here are just some of the results from, from the experiment. So indoors, um, understandably, the kids tended to make things that were not at real scale, using a whole host of cardboard boxes and tubes and egg cartons. And then outdoors, they showed some very interesting differences. Firstly, the teamwork was, was way superior, particularly those children who were not engaged in the classroom. So one of the teacher comments was here about a child who had some difficulties in class, who became a wee leader outside, giving people instructions. And the scale of these toys and models outdoors was really quite phenomenal. So there was, there was a difference there in social interactions. And these were just some of his survey measures that he took. So he asked the children on four performance criteria where they most enjoyed doing that experiment. Um, those are his four variables, enjoyment, um, the, the extent of ideas, the level of discovery and social interaction. And then the, the actual setting criteria, PRS means perceived restorative scale. We measure a restorative environment through these four um, attributes, which I talked about earlier, fascination, compatibility, being away and extent. And he used fairly friendly, um, intuitive kind of survey methods to get their responses. So what did he find? So he found that outdoor tasks were recalled more readily and in richer detail. The language that these children used was richer in terms of their descriptions of that task. But what was interesting was the greatest level of recall uh, was actually in the wildest of the three playground settings. So nature there and its degree of wildness seemed to be making a difference. Uh, on the preference ratings, both the children and the teachers preferred the outdoor tasks. I might come back and talk about teacher preference of wild settings, because that's not always the case. And some teachers are uh, somewhat, um, uh, perhaps fearful of taking children outdoors because there are more risks and it would be great to get your perspectives on that at the end. Um, the underachievers, so in each group he had a group of underachievers. Now he wasn't exposed to what their particular problems were, that was confidential. I've got some charts to show you these outcomes in a moment, but the underachievers recall more outdoors than their peers in the wilder setting. And his observational data showed greater evidence of physical mobility. That seems fairly obvious. If you're in a bigger space, you're going to move around a bit more, but also evidence of social interaction and greater creative diversity outdoors. And just a couple of charts to show you. So this was the answer to his first prompt. What did you recall more readily? And 74% of the children recalled that outdoor task as their first task, compared to 
see you call the indoor task. Let me just look at the underachievers. This is a box plot. This is a kind of chart environmental psychologists um, like to churn out. The really important thing there is the dark. I could use my pointer indeed, actually. Um, <laughs> this is the mean. This is the average. So the average for the able kids in this particular school, they recalled around two of those um, experiments. Whereas the underachievers, their recall level was, was significantly higher in that particular setting. So Jamie, yeah, I'll just, Jamie's still writing this up. He's been writing it up for a long time. <laughs> and um, we're really hoping he's going to submit it uh, at the end of this year. Uh, there's a lot of interest from the Scottish Government in what he's produced. And while he started the study in 2012, actually before the Scandinavian research came out around cognitive recall, and he's a little bit hacked off that they've kind of um, beaten him to it in terms of his findings. But really, it was a very innovative uh, notion to look at cognitive recall in, in early years. Okay, so study two now moves on to the older age group. These were studies in teenagers, adolescents aged 11 to 12, looking at restorative health outcomes of forest versus indoor settings in young people with varying behaviour states. I did try and edit my language, but occasionally uh, I get some spellings that creep in from the UK in relation to vague behaviour, and there's one there. Um, so, here we are in a deprived inner city school in Glasgow with a study number of 18, um, aged 11 to 13 actually, there were two years involved in this study. I'm going to show you a short clip of the film that these children made, or teenagers made I should say, uh, which will give you an indication, but you can see from the, this is Scotland in the winter, um, it's pretty, pretty, pretty tough. <laughs> and it's pretty muddy and there were some problems in relation to that in terms of staff engagement which I'll talk about in a while and the study design was um, we had again two behavior groups so we had a group for very simplistic terms defined as good versus poor behavior again we weren't a party to what was particularly an issue with those young people's behaviour, but some of them had been excluded from school because of their behavioural problems. And I measured them over a day. Now, a typical environmental uh, psychology experiment measures somebody before that intervention, as I said earlier. So I measured them on a range of dimensions. I measured their mood using um, the US Mood Adjective Checklist, which actually gauges their levels of stress, self-reported stress, anger, Hedonic tone, which is just a sort of happiness rating, and their energy levels. And then I looked at dimensions of their personal goals. I did a bit of experimental work with them, really trying to unpick what some of their personal projects were, and whether actually being in the forest really improved their perception of their goals. And this is the technique to my work that, that kind of distinguishes what I do a little bit, in that I use goals and sense of purpose and challenge of goals as a way of really harnessing well-being. And I think it works particularly well in young people, it works particularly well with people with mental health problems, um, and it's a wonderful method. So that was the design of the study, and I, I'm going to show you a couple of the outcomes here. So this is the outcome between the groups on their anger levels. I measured them in school and then twice over the day in the forest. You'll see in a moment what a forest school looks like. And let's just take the good behaviour group here. Um, okay, so with the groups were statistically significantly different at the start of their day in school. And you can see the levels of anger in, or the difference between the levels of anger I think I should use my pointer here. So anger was pretty high at the end of the school day in the kids with the poor behaviour. It was much lower in those kids with the good behaviour. But look what happens in the forest. The anger levels come right down in those uh, young people. And also we see the same benefit to anger levels in the good behaviour group. But the, dr the dramatic finding really is in relation to anger levels in those kids with the poor behaviour.
Any questions about the chart? Okay, I'll move on to another one, which, yes. So, I was interested, is this, um, so this is a single setting, this is like a repeat intervention, so you're doing this one time? So they did Forest School over a period of 10 weeks, so it's a program, it's an outdoor education program run by the Forest Commission in Scotland, thank you for asking that question, and I measured them on two occasions over the space of a month, and I measured them in the school, kind of baseline, before they started the study. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. I measured them twice because I wanted to see if I could get a replication in my results over those two different time points. And, and was there, um, did you have a group of children of poor behavior that were not exposed to forestry? No, they were, they were, all, they were all exposed. So two groups measured in the school before the environmental program commenced and then measured again pre and post the day. So they were measured at the beginning of the day and at the end of the day. And this gives their end of day score. Okay? okay. So, um, and then we have the same kind of chart showing the change in hedonic tone. So again, both groups at the end of a school day, fairly unhappy actually. Um, but if we look at their hedonic tone levels, in the forest setting, we see a vast improvement in their, in their mood at the end of that day, which is also reflected on their energy as well. Um, but we see a difference here, okay? So the kids with the good behaviour were not as happy as the kids with the poor behaviour. And I'm going to try and show a film now that will help unpick what was going on here in the forest. What I want to say about the film is, um, it's not good quality. It's made entirely by these young people. They were entirely in control of what questions they asked and what they filmed. The idea was to have um, a video booth. Uh, do you have Big Brother here in the States? Mm -hmm. So we took the model from Big Brother where uh, candidates can go into a booth and talk about how they feel. Mm -hmm. And this is what we had in this forest. They created it, they set it up, and they monitored it and filmed it, and uh, were involved in some of the editing. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to try and show you just three minutes worth of what they produced.